Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for a gathering tonight. Thank you for the faithfulness of your children, sons, daughters, servants of the Lord. We're asking, Lord, tonight you open our eyes once again to see, our hearts to understand, to meditate on your word, and to have the proper attitude of preparation for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight, we come to consider an important subject in the scriptures. Very important to every one of us. We're talking about the sure prophecy of Christ's second coming. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world He had been telling them about things that will happen At the end of the age And they wanted to know number one When shall these things be? Number two They wanted to know the signs of his coming These were disciples Followers of the Lord They had seen him And they knew that he had come the first time and so the coming they were referring to now, the sign of thy coming. He had told many parables and he had given them assurance that he will go away and he will come again. Watch then are the signs of thy coming. Number three, they wanted to know the sign of the end of the world, the end of of the age. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He assured them he will come again. He was ready with them. He came the first time. This is the second coming. He said, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That means you're not becoming gradually and you know for days and weeks and months and people will be seeing him gathering and all the clouds. He said no, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, just like that suddenly he will come and then he tells us in verse 30 in verse 30 he says and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming again he's talking about the second coming coming in the clouds when he came the first time he didn't come in the clouds this referring to the coming again the second coming the sudden coming and the soon coming of the son of man and then he said he will come with the clouds of heaven by power and great glory it tells us in verse uh, in verse 35 it says heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away this word about his coming again this word about his appearing coming the second time with the clouds will not pass away then he tells us in verse 36 he says but of the day of that day and our knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven 
but my father only jesus said no man knows no one knows no one at that time no one at this time no one in the whole world knows when christ will come again and so when you uh, hear of uh, people who are setting dates and they say that this particular time uh, this particular month or this particular year is when christ will come we shouldn't even be, you know, reading what they are writing or listening to what they are saying or what they are posting anywhere. Because Jesus said of that day and that hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only, verse 37, in verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Have you noticed I mentioned the coming of the son of man the coming of the son of man over and over to tell us that this is sure he will come again verse 38 it says for as the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, verse 39, it says, and they knew not, they knew not, all those people, they knew not, they, they heard about it, that the rain was coming, the flood was coming, they knew that judgment was coming, but they were not prepared, they were not concerned, their minds were not there, and Jesus said, they knew not when the, until the flood came and took the them all away so shall also the coming so shall also the coming of the son of man not be it tells us in second peter chapter 1 reading from verse 16 it says for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming the power and the coming of our lord jesus christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty it says it's not a you know fairy tale it's not old women's uh, story this is not cunningly devised fable it said uh, the certainty and the surety of the coming of the lord we were with him on the mountain we saw his power and then we saw the coming glory of the lord it tells us in um, he tells us in verse 19, in verse 19 it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. All the prophets of old, they prophesied about his first coming, about the second coming, we, the apostles, and we who are filled with the Spirit of God, we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. As we read about the second coming, as we read about the sudden appearance of the Lord, as we read about the coming again, the appearance of the Lord, how it will come, it says, we should take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day, the day star arise in your heart. There, there are three things you want to understand. Number one, every eye shall see him. In Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds and every eye shall see him every eye shall see him number two every heart shall melt for the consternation the things that will happen the things they will see the things they will send the things they will feel at the time of the coming of the lord number one every eye shall see him number two every heart shall melt for the consternation number three every ear should hear 
If every eye will see at that time, if every heart will melt at that time, this is the time for us to tell and to tell the people that Christ is coming and that when he comes, these are the things that will take place. Every ear should hear of him before his coming to reign. We're looking at Romans chapter 10, verse 18. In Romans chapter 10, verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Yes, truly. Yes, certainly. It says, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the earth. Their words went unto the ends of the earth. That means then that this at this time, as we come nearer and nearer, closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, we should make the effort that as they heard at that time in Romans chapter 10 verse 18, we at this time should make it known Christ is coming. We shouldn't only be talking about his first coming, about the cross, about Calvary, about his sacrifice, about how he died for us. We should be telling the people, and uh, when we're doing so, we need telling the people, when we're the evangelistic field, telling the people at the GCK in crusades everywhere, every ear should hear that Christ is coming. And every sinner should prepare for the coming of the Lord. That, that's why it says at that time, their words went on the ends until the ends of the world. Sinners should hear. Saints should hear. Prodigal sons, prodigal daughters, prodigal prophets like Jonah, they should hear that Christ is coming. The lukewarm should hear that Christ is coming again. And when Christ comes, if the righteous castly be saved, what will the end of them be that will be not the gospel of the Lord? And, uh, you know, every member of the church and every church should hear that our Christ is coming again. I pray that when he comes, none of us will be disappointed in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 14. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Every ear should hear. This gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come there are three things we're looking at number one we're looking at the prophecy and the picture of christ's second coming the picture what had happened before that shows us that really christ is coming again and the prophecy number two the perception and preparation for his second coming the perception our understanding and meditating on the fact that Christ is coming, the perception and the preparation for his second coming. Number three, the purpose and the passion before his surprising coming. He comes surprisingly, he comes suddenly, and that sudden coming is very near. It will come as a surprise to the people that dwell in the world. They'll not be prepared. It will take them unawares. But we have to prepare. And we have to be ready. And we want to understand the passion we ought to have. And the purpose that we ought to have in our heart concerning his coming, which will surprise many people. Look at number one here. Now, Number one, we're talking about the prophecy and the picture of Christ's second coming. The prophecy and the picture of Christ's second coming. In Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 32. Mark chapter 13, verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven neither the Son but the Father. 
the angels which are in heaven no they don't know the date they don't know the hour they don't know the time they don't know the months of the year how will a man here or not then say he knows even the son of man neither the son but the father look at verse 33 in verse 33 take heed take ye heed watch and pray for ye know not when the time is ye know not when the time is it tells us in verse 34 it says for the son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch and commanded his people to watch in verse 35 verse 35 says what she therefore believers what she therefore members of the body of christ what she therefore the congregation of the righteous the congregation of the saints what she therefore ministers and members what she therefore apostles and the followers of christ what she therefore for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening or at midnight or at cock crowing or in the morning verse 36 it says let's come in suddenly he find you sleeping and he was talking to his own people he was talking to his own apostles and disciples and yet he said that we still have to watch members those who are born again those who are saved those who are children of god we still have to watch and those who are even preachers of the word apostles and the prophets evangelists pastors and teachers leaders in the kingdom we still have to, to watch less coming suddenly he find you sleeping in verse 37 he says what i and what i say unto you i say unto all watch the prophecy and the picture of christ's second coming look at three things there number one number one is the hallowed proclamation of his second coming number two his heavenly prophecy concerning his soon coming and then number three is the historic picture of a sure second coming look at number one number one is hallowed proclamation of his second coming in matthew chapter 26 reading from verse 63 look at this and you understand here at in this chapter and this verse christ was under trial the high priest was asking question and his answer could mean crucifixion and could mean this now if you are put in a situation where your answer to the question will seal the judgment and they will say you've heard him look at what he said what do you think of this because of what he said he ought to die that's how sacred this moment was in matthew chapter 26 verse 63 but jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said unto him i adjure thee by the living god that thou tell us whether thou art the christ the son of god he was under oath at this time and the high priest wanted to know tell us and he wouldn't answer him any other time but this time i adjure thee by the living god tell us and now look at the answer that's why this is hallowed this is secret because nobody would have said anything like this in verse 64 if it were not true because it will cost him his life jesus says unto him thou hast said nevertheless i say unto you hereafter shall ye see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven secret hallowed 
high, heavenly, that he could say such a thing if it were not true. He will not tell that kind of man. If it were not true, he will not say this that will make the high priest say, everybody you have heard and you know that he should be crucified. We're looking at chapter 16 of Matthew, reading from verse 21. It said, from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and uh, be raised from the dead. The third day raised again, the third day, then verse 22. And in verse 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Verse 23, in verse 23, and he turned and said unto him, unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Verse 24. In verse 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25, verse 25 says, For whosoever shall save his life, and whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Verse 26, For what is a man profited? What's a man going to gain? What's the profit to a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If he shall gain all the good, good things, valuable things of the world and lose his soul? What's the profit to a man if he shall gain all the money, all the material things, all the prestige, all the honor, all the glory of this world? And lose is also what's the what's the profit to a man if he shall gain all the things that the people of the world are running after, and after he has gained them, he loses his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Look at verse 27. In verse 27, for the Son of Man shall come. He was talking about his death, about his burial, about his resurrection. He was talking about the cross that the disciples will have to bear, about the persecution we will have to endure. And then immediately he went to this fact. He said, the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and they shall reward every man according to his works. It's coming again. The very fact that at such delicate times, the very fact that at the time he was talking about his death, burial, resurrection, he will also talk about his coming again. That makes it a hallowed proclamation. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the heavenly Prophecy concerning his soon coming. It tells us in Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 7. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and, if, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, 
the Almighty. That this time was in heaven, and he declared from heaven that he is the one to come. Look at chapter 2, reading from verse 25. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 25, but that which thou what that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. He was in heaven, he was talking from heaven. This is prophecy from heaven till I come. Verse 26, in verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Keepeth my works unto the end. I got saved, continue till the end. I am sanctified, continue till the end. I'm serving the Lord, continue till the end. I'm sanctified and holy, continue in that sanctification and holiness until then by the grace of god i am steadfast continue until the end that's that's the secret of being ready for the coming of the lord he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him i will give power over the nations in verse 27 verse 27 and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as i received of my father it was in heaven and it was proclaiming from heaven that he is coming again chapter 3 we're looking at verse 11 revelation chapter 3 verse 11 behold i come quickly you see that emphasizing all the time he, he was on earth he died was buried rose again ascended to heaven and now from heaven he speaks to the church and he says behold i come quickly be and hold fast that which thou hast that no man take thy crown hold fast that which you have your experience of being born again hold it fast your testimony of becoming a new creature in christ hold it fast your sanctification experience and your purity of heart blessed is he blessed are they and the pure in heart for they shall see god hold fast the purity of heart temptation will try to take it away from you the trials of the world will try to take it away from you and the people who are backsliding who are not holding on to that steadfast sanctified experience they'll try to knock it out of your hand it says i come quickly i'm coming again and if there is anything you ought to hold fast your conversion your conviction your consecration it says behold i come quickly hold that fast which thou hast of course if you have nothing there's nothing to hold fast to if you have no conviction there's nothing to hold fast to if you have no consecration if you have no commitment there's nothing to hold on to if you have no vision if you have no purpose of heart there's nothing to hold fast to you are empty your hands are empty and what are you holding but if you have something whole uh, worth keeping if you have something that you know that this is what will take me to heaven when it comes it says hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown look at verse 12 in verse 12 him that overcometh will i make a pillar in the temple in, his, in the temple of my god and he shall go no more out and i will write upon him the name of my god and the name of the city of my god which is new jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my god and i will write upon him my new name he tells us while in heaven he says i'm coming i'm coming hold 
that fast which you have look at number three here number three is the historic picture of a sure second coming there's a picture it gives us already that this happened in the past hold that picture in your mind hold the picture before you viewing it all the time and make yourself to go to go there and be part of that picture and say if i were there at that time what would have happened unto me what picture is that it's in matthew chapter 24 and i'm reading from verse 35 it says seven and i shall pass away but my word shall not pass away heaven and earth shall pass away not a judge not a teacher not the cross of a T, not the dot of an I, not a word, not a sentence, not a doctrine, not a prophecy, not a proclamation will pass away. He says it's easier for the sky to pass away. It's easier for the sun and the moon and the stars to pass away than for any of my words to pass away. Think about it then as he talks about a second coming. If the, if the world can pass away, the earth, the globe can pass away, the stars can pass away, he said, my word, my prophecy, my proclamation, the prediction, everything he said, he said, not any of those words will pass away. Look at the picture in verse 36, but of that day and our knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only you know those faithful angels once they had that and jesus said you cannot know this you know what they'll do they close their mind against that they'll not be searching they'll not be seeking they not be finding out. Jesus said they couldn't know the day, so they accepted. But you know, backsliding so-called prophets, Jesus said, no man can know this, not an angel can know this, not, to, not even the Son of Man. And those backsliding people, they want to have the honor of the people of the world rushing after them. They've got the secret that Jesus said they could not have and they'll be fasting and praying and seeking to know and seeking to find out what Jesus said they will never know why waste our time why waste our life why waste our strength seeking for things that Jesus said you will never find out but of that day an hour knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father will be start his seven in verse 37 but at the days of Noah was so shall also the coming of the son of man be he said can I show you a picture can I show you what happened in history and the coming of the son of man will be exactly like this verse 38 in verse 38 for at the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking think about that all our lives now the things we pursue the work we do the reason men and women are awake every hour of the day in the day and in the night is so that they'll get enough to buy what to eat and to drink that their minds will be on that the reason we study the reason we have certificate the reason why we travel overseas and the reason why parents will throw their children away overseas and not to even think of the things of god but they must have degree another degree another degree why for building a shelter here on earth and for eating and drinking and jesus said as it was 
just before the flood and the flood will come and sweep everything away even so shall it be at the coming of the son of man they were drink, eating and drinking they were marrying and giving a marriage that's the preoccupation for those who are not married yet, they can leave a holiness, preaching church, a Bible-believing church. Uh, they want to go any other church. They'll still go to church. Their mind tells them uh, there is God. Their mind tells them uh, the Bible is true. But they don't want to stay in the church that will preach the word of God. That will preach about the reason for his first coming and the purpose of his second coming. You know, they don't want to stay there. All they want, marrying and giving in marriage, marrying and giving in marriage, and their appearance, those are the things that their minds are talking about, thinking about all the time. Marriage, marriage, marriage of my daughter, marriage of my son. She must have a child before I die. And they're not thinking of the coming of the Lord. Jesus said at that time, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day day that Noah entered into the ark in verse 39 it says a new note until the flood came a new note until the flood came there are many people who go to church there are many people who are religious there are many people they will not know the time when Christ will come their minds will be so much on amassing wealth and having the things of the world and getting married and you know having children and you know planning marriage for children and everything only the things of this world until Christ will come Jesus said so shall also the coming of the son of man be jesus said that's exactly where the minds of the people will be at the time of his coming he wants us to be wise in luke chapter 21 reading from verse 34 luke chapter 21 verse 34 and take it to yourselves let's at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life so that they come upon you unawares he's still talking about the time of his coming and he tells disciples he tells apostles he tells believers he tells members of his body members of the church he tells ministers and everyone he says take heed to yourselves do you ever take it to yourself? Do you ever check yourself? Do you sometimes pinch yourself and say, what are you planning? What are you thinking about? On what is your heart centered? Do you ever wake up yourself, stir up yourself and say, do you ever remember the words of Jesus Christ? Are you just rolling on and going on without checking yourself? What you were yesterday is what you are today, and what you are today is what you will be tomorrow. Jesus said, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness, and it cares of this life so that they come upon you unawares. Verse 35, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. In verse 36, it says, watch ye therefore. Don't be like them, greedy like them. Don't be like them, pursuing the things of the world like them. Don't be like them, suffering, you know, all the things of the world. It is tough for your mind. And you're spiritually dead, dull, dormant, 
on awaking. He says, watch ye therefore and pray always. It's not talking about praying for wife, praying for husband, praying for children, praying for work, praying to travel out of the country. It's talking about praying to be ready when the Lord will come. Pray always. Pray always. And pray always that ye be not, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, we're looking at the perception and preparation for his second coming. If you do not understand from the depths of your heart the coming of the Lord, and if you do not understand how near, how soon, how sudden, how surprising that coming of the Lord will be, you will not prepare. Perception precedes preparedness. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 42. I'm reading here from verse 19. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 19. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Blind, not perceptive, not discerning, not understanding who is blind as the Lord's servant. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, you see many things, all the many things that are happening in the world right now. Seeing many things, all the things that are happening in our own country, in our own continent, all the things that are happening all over the world. The things we never thought about, the things we never heard of in the world in which we live. We hear of many things and we see many things. It says it's servants and the church members and the church goers. Thou, but thou observest not, opening the eyes, but he heareth not. And he's talking about his servant. He's talking about the people that know the Lord, not just that we claim to know the Lord, we know the Lord. He said, they are my servants. And yet, they perceive not. Look at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the slowness of perception concerning his prophesied coming. The prophecies are there. The coming is prophesied, and yet we are slow in perception, slow in understanding. Number two, the slackness in preparation with personal carelessness. There's, personally, if when you check up about people, they may say, yes, I know the doctrine, Christ is coming, I believe it, but they're so slack because there's carelessness in their lives. Number three, our steadfastness of purpose and pure conscience. Num with pure conscience, number one, we're looking at the slowness of per in perception concerning uh, is prophesied coming. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, he was talking to uh, two of his disciples. He was talking about those who knew about Christ. They were on their way, they were on the road to Emmaus. And then they were talking about uh, Christ. And then he came. They didn't know he was the one. And he said, what are you talking about? And they said, are you a stranger? And don't you know what has happened in the land at this time? He said, what is that? They said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And he told the story. And now he told them, oh fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
The reason they were surprised about what was happening, the reason they were confused about what had happened, is because they were slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And when Jesus looks at the majority of people in the church, the majority of members of Bible believing churches, they have read the prophecy, they have heard about the prediction, they have heard about the proclamation of of christ and yet in their attitude yet in their mind yet in their living ordinarily from day to day jesus could easily tell them who oh fools slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken those people did not believe all that the prophets had spoken concerning the first coming now today many people do not believe or they are slow of heart they are slow in perception to believe all that the prophets have spoken concerning his coming again now let, let, let's look at this passage again there's something to to look at there we're looking at matthew chapter 24 verse 38 i need to point out something there it says for as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until until that until the day that noah entered into the act verse 39 in verse 39 and knew not and knew not what did they know noah was preaching while he was building the ark Noah was telling them, the flood is coming, the flood is coming, and knew not. They heard, they didn't take it to heart. And Noah repeated it one year, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, all those many years, more than a century. He kept on telling them, and yet, they knew not. People can hear the doctrine, a crisis coming and it's coming again and when he comes this is what will happen and yet they will not know and you not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the son of man be look at luke chapter 21 i'm reading from verse 25 in verse 35 for as is near shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth as a snare it will come and it's, ah, ah, so it is true so it will happen that's how it will happen unto them in first thessalonians chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 2 it says for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the lord comes as a thief in the night look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction cometh upon them when they shall say peace and safety no danger in the clouds no danger in the sky no danger anywhere we say peace has finally come because they do not have the heart to perceive the things that will happen that that's why it says for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape I pray it will not come upon us like that unawares, unprepared, unconcerned, undiscerning in Jesus name Look at number two. Number two is the slackness in preparation because of their personal carelessness. Personal carelessness. In Exodus chapter 9, reading from verse 18. Exodus chapter 9, we're reading from verse 18. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, 
I will cause to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Here Moses made the proclamation, and he said, there's prophecy here, there's prediction here, something happened tomorrow. It had never happened in Egypt before, but this is coming. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die that the prophecy they shall die therefore tell them to come from the field tell them to leave everything they do in the time is short look at verse 20 in verse 20 he that fearest the Lord, the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. Verse 21. In verse 21, and he that regardeth not the word of the Lord. That's Moses strengthening us. That's preacher. The preacher of the day of doom is threatening us. That's the proclaimer. They're doing that to make us afraid. They're doing us to they're doing that to make us change this and change that. But he doesn't know we are the people of adamant mind, incorrigible, untouchable, unteachable. And so he that regarded not the watch of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Verse 22. In verse 22, and the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, and that there may be hail, hail like a heavy stones, almost as heavy as half a bag of cement coming down from the sky that it may, there may be hail in all the land of Egypt all the land upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt look at verse 23 in verse 23 and Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the, and, the, and the fire ran along upon the ground. And the Lord rained hail, heavy stones upon the land of Egypt. Verse 24. In verse 24, it tells us, it says, So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail very grievous such as there was none like it in all the land of egypt since it became a nation verse 25 in verse 25 it says and the hill smote throughout all the land of egypt all that was in the field both man and beast and the hail smote every herb of the field and break of the tree of the field. That's the people who did not believe, the people who did not accept, the people who just went on business as usual. And they will not take heed to the warning of the Lord, the proclamation of the Lord, and the prophecy of the coming 
heavy hail upon the land here is our time now and the lord is saying that we need to watch we need to take heed and we need to be conscious that the lord can come anytime he tells us in james chapter 5 reading from verse 7 james chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 7 it says be patient therefore be patient in your trouble be persevering in your trial brethren unto the coming of the lord see that every person is emphasizing until the coming of the lord behold the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. look at verse 8 in verse 8 be ye also patient persevering establish your hearts for the coming of the lord draweth nigh the coming of the lord draweth nigh we're prepared don't be like all those people in egypt watch a dull mind, dull understanding, and they were not ready, and the judgment came upon them. Look at number three here. Number three, our steadfastness of purpose or pure conscience. Steadfastness of purpose, because the Lord is coming. Acts chapter 24, reading from verse 15. In Acts 24, verse 15, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Paul the apostle said, this Jews they know too that the Lord is coming. He also knows the difference is they know he is coming. They are not prepared. They are not getting ready. They know he is coming. They are like the foolish virgins. They carry empty lambs without oil. They carry empty profession without purity of heart and without the strengthening power of the Holy Ghost. Foolish virgins. And then eventually the cry will go out. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And they try to tune their lambs, but... It will not come up because they do not have that extra oil. They have not gone the extra mile, extra mile in praying, extra mile in preparation, extra mile in purity of heart, extra mile in preparedness for the coming of the Lord. And then after the Lord has come and the wise virgins enter in, they later came and knocked at the door and he said, Lord, Lord, open to us. And Jesus said, the Lord will say, I never, I know you not, depart from me because they were careless. Look at your life. Will it be like that when Christ will come? Like it happened when the flood came upon the people? Let's get ready. It says in verse 16, in verse 16 it says, And herein do I exercise myself. Remember, he spoke in verse 15, the Lord is coming. Now he said because of that, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscious voyage of offense toward God and toward men. I pray we'll be ready. You'll be ready. I will be ready. The Lord confirm it to your life in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Conscience matters a lot. Conscience is what keeps you alert. Conscience is what jolts you, jerks you, stirs you 
of conscience and the policeman inside you there that says is that right is that good that the holiness you are hearing about preacher that's what you are doing is that the holiness you are preaching that temper that boisterous temper that angry kind of busting out ah believer the policeman is saying on the inside is that right would you like christ to come now and if you have been like this all the time if you continue like this until the day the time the moment comes that christ comes where will you be and where will you spend eternity why don't you let your heart and let your conscience be so tender be so much at a large that you'll not just be doing this and that without taking it that your conscience is sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water look at verse 37 in verse 37 it says for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry verse 38 in verse 38 now the just shall live by faith the just shall live in faithfulness but if any man draw back, my soul shall not have, shall have no pleasure in him. If any man draws back from the experience of his conversion, if any man draws back from the evidence of his consecration, if any man draws back from the expression of his conviction, you know when we were converted we had conviction and everywhere we went every office we walked every person we interacted with we carried our convictions with us we didn't leave a conviction in the church building we didn't leave a conviction in the house everywhere we went we went with the expression of our conviction we wait for the evidence of a consecration, the experience of a conversion. But you see, there are people at this late hour, as Christ is coming, it looks like they have never tasted conversion. It looks like they do not have any consecration. It looks like they do not have any conviction at all. Uh, they, they draw back, and God said, if any man draw back, from his conversion, his consecration, his conviction, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back. We are not of them who draw back. You know, surprisingly, those who have drawn back, they feel lonely where they are. And instead of coming back like the prodigal son, they want to invite the rest of us. Why don't you join me? If you're feeling lonely in your backsliding state, why don't you come back? Why are you calling believers to come and join you? If you're feeling awkward in your compromise, why are you telling us to, you know, to compromise with you and agree with you? If you're feeling awkward there and you're odd there in your compromise, why don't you leave that and come? We well, will not draw back. I will not draw back. And you know, sometimes, uh, depending on, you know, where your heart is, when people who are very dear to you, people who are very close to you, people who are very precious to you, when you discover that they have turned back, they have gone back, they don't show any experience of conversion anymore, any evidence of consecration anymore, any expression of conviction anymore, your love for them, your attachment to them makes you to want to, you know, pity them and, you know, embrace them. And they're not changing. They're who they are. 
prodigal son, prodigal daughter. They're not regretting. They're not rushing back into the very center of the burning flame of conviction. They are way there. Uh, and you so sympathize with them. You join them. You draw back of them unto perdition. I will never draw back. I will never draw back. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe and keep on believing to the saving of the soul. Amen. I'm coming to point number three here. Point number three, the purpose and passion before his surprising coming. He's coming. He's coming. And we need to keep the purpose of what we have. We need to keep the mind, the consecration, the commitment that we have. In Isaiah chapter 50, chapter 33, Isaiah chapter 33, we're reading from verse 14. This, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire. Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting bonnies? In verse 15, verse 15 tells us, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, He that despises the gain of oppressions, That shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, that shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Look at that. Those who will see the king when he comes, king of kings, lord of lords. Those who will see the redeemer as it comes in the clouds. It says, they shut their eyes from evil. They don't, they don't look at evil. They don't come into, you know, the present day enjoyment of evil. They will not fight. But if they see two people fighting on the street and using broken bottle on, you know, each other, they'll stay there and be watching them. If they see somebody destroying the life of another one on the street, they'll stay there on the street corner and be watching. They won't do it, but they'll watch. If they see it on television, they don't do it, but they'll watch. If they see it on social media, they won't do it, but they'll watch. They take delight the in those evil things that are taking place in the world. And they're watching them. And it says the people who will see the king when he comes, they're sure they'll stop their ears from hearing of blood, hearing all those things, hearing. There are people, the world has taken the minds of even church goers and church members away that they enjoy all those evil things and they're holding up bribes, bribes. The people, you know, believers, they've forgotten that the love of money is the root of all evil. And when you're waiting for the coming of the Lord, bribery, corruption is no more part of your life. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him waters his waters shall be sure. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, Then I shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. We're looking at three things here. Number one, purposefully waiting for his coming from heaven. Number two, passionately working with consecration 
on the harvest number three personally walking with consistency in holiness those are the people who are getting ready for the coming of the lord look at number one number one purposefully waiting for the coming for his coming from heaven in first thessalonians chapter one i'm reading from verse six first thessalonians chapter one verse six and he became followers of us and of the lord having received the word in much affliction with joy joy of the holy ghost look at verse 10 in verse 10 it says and to wait for his son from heaven born again converted and consecrated and committed holding on to their conviction because there's just one event they were waiting for to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come he delivered us will remain delivered in jesus name and we're looking at um, colossians chapter 3 reading from verse 1 colossians chapter 3 verse 1 it tells us if he then be risen where christ seek those things which are above where christ seated on the right hand of god look at verse 2 in verse 2 set your affection set your affection take your affection away from the things of the world take your affection away from you know the things of the flesh set your affection on things above not on things on the earth look at verse 3 for ye are dead and your life is hid with christ in god verse 4 when christ who is our life shall appear then shall you also appear with him in glory and the people appear with him in glory they say amen, amen. we're looking at number two here number two we're looking at passionately walking with consecration on the harvest you know when we're working for the lord and working with the lord and we're doing so winning and we're doing the preaching we're doing whatever we're doing we'll bring life into what we're doing we'll bring joy into what we're doing excitement into what we're doing we're so excited and passionate that you know we have the chance to work for the lord that who knows the last person i will talk to before he comes who knows the last crusade we would hold before he comes who knows the last prayer meeting we'll have before he comes who knows the last meeting we will have before he comes who knows the last prayer we will pray before he comes who knows the last temptation we will resist before he comes because of that we're living this day what if it were my last day because of that we're preaching this message what if it were my last preaching because of that we're doing this evangelism what if it were my very last with excitement with joy with cheerfulness with passion in our heart because we passionately walk for the lord or consecration on the harvest field in jeremiah chapter 5 we're looking at verse 24 neither say they in their heart let us now fear the lord our god that giveth us rain both the former and the latter in his season he reserves unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest he reserves unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest and what he these were the last days of the appointed weeks and what he these are the last minutes 
of the appointed week so i was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the lord i was glad when they said unto me let us go and do some harvesting for the lord let us go and do the work of the lord and we go do that with passion with excitement well there might be thorns on the roses there may be thorns on the road depends on what we're looking at we look at the flower we don't look at the sun we look at the joy of souls being saved we don't look at you know the pressure the pain the persecution we look at the very fact that we're chosen to walk for the lord we don't look at you know whatever negative thing might happen there that's not a consecration we're just happy that we have the appointed weeks of the harvest and we're making use of it in Jeremiah chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 20 here is something we do not want our neighbors to say our friends to say the sinners around us to say the harvest is past the summer is ended and we are not saved the time will come when there will be no chance for crusade anymore, no chance for soul winning anymore, no chance for going out and harvesting on the field. The time will come when the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds and then everything is over and there will be people that will say, the harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. If they are people you could have reached, the people you could have touched, the people you could have witnessed to, the people you could have knocked at the doors of their houses, but you didn't, what will happen then? Everything is ended. All opportunity gone. But you didn't make use appropriately of the reserved weeks of the harvest. John chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 35. In John chapter 4, verse 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Do you see the difference between the Lord and the people of the Lord? The people of the Lord seen that yet four months. There's still time. I concentrate on my own personal achievement now. There's still time. When I've done this and done this and done that, then I will go and be involved in the harvest. And Jesus said, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. I pray I will not miss our chance in Jesus' name. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto, the, unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Sowing. Why sowing? What can be rejoicing? While our hands are sometimes preached, while the thorns on the field, we can still rejoice. And while we're sweating, we can still rejoice. While we're reaping, sowing, working, laboring, soul winning, preaching, praying, we can still rejoice. So that we're not preaching under a heavy load, under discouragement, under tiredness, under weariness, it says, so that he that soweth and he that repaired may rejoice together. In verse 37, verse 37 tells us, 
and herein is the same true one soweth and another reapeth verse 38 I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor other men labored and ye are entered into their labors I pray we'll be up and doing in Jesus' name. We'll not be slack. I will not be slack. This day of opportunity in reaping, in sowing, evangelizing, winning souls, witnessing for the Lord. Look at number three. Number three, we're looking at personally walking with consistency in holiness while we're laboring for the Lord, we're personally and we're persistently, perseveringly walking, we're consecration and consistency in holiness. In Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 17, Luke chapter 1, verse 17, and it shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. For John the Baptist, make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And for the people of God today, uh, for John, he was making the proof ready for the first coming and we now for his second coming that you're preparing the local church where you are you're preparing the district church where you are you're preparing everyone you know, everyone you have contact with in the group of districts where you are in the region where you're in the state where you are in the nation where you are every opportunity you have to give any message to the people you're preparing in such a way should this be the last message you preach you want to use it to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord and may the Lord use everything you have heard today to prepare you for his coming in Jesus name so that you'll be at a large or the trumpet sound anytime by the grace of God you'll be ready and those of us who are preaching, those of us who are leading other people, that we ourselves, the messages God gives us to give the people, we're not just like those, uh, you know, bus conductors who prepare people to go on a journey and they stay pure to where they want. That the people, those of us who are preaching, will not be, you know, at the back over there, you know, still thinking the same way we ever thought and living the way we ever lived and still dull of here. And even though we're preaching, that we preachers will prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord too. Amen. And all the hearers, you will be prepared for the coming of the Lord to you. And all workers, all workers, all workers, workers that help other people, prepare other people, arrange other people, whatever we do, we're not just arranging them, preparing them to hear we ourselves, we will be ready for that day in Jesus' name so that we are prepared they are prepared you are prepared everyone everywhere making ready a people ready and prepared for the coming of the lord we're going to pray tonight and as i said we don't know the last prayer we're going to pray before he comes so with all our heart all our soul all our mind with excitement with, com with commitment and consecration we really cry to the lord that god will make us ready for the coming of our lord god bless you please rise up and let us talk to the lord in prayer rise up rise up forget every other thing now and just only think about what we have heard that this message will not go unheeded by those of us who have heard 
will be ready as he comes.